Now, you're welcome back. Very happy to say Tom English of the BBC in Scotland is with us. Hello, Tom. Hi, Joe. Your heart was in Crow Park on Sunday, I suspect. <laughs> it was. It absolutely was, yeah. My God, I mean, no matter what sport we cover for the rest of the year, Joe, or maybe for the rest of the millennium, I'm not sure we'll see a performance from a team like that again. Oh. I'm biased, I know, but... No, it's true. What a, what a performance. Getting serious now for the rest of them. We were just uh, remarking on the show that your oldest outfield player is 28. So I don't think this is the end somehow. Yeah, well, I was listening to your stuff over the last few days and it was great to listen to it, great interviews. And they're just hungry, aren't they? Mm. I mean, it's not just everything that they have on the field. It's everything they have in their heads as well. And, you know, okay, they've won another All-Ireland, but they're not sated by it. None, you know, none of them seem to be. Um, extraordinary. I mean, it's just. I mean, I went to, went back and watched it again the other night, um, because that first half in particular, it was just off the scale. I mean, I'm no hurling expert, but I know greatness when I see it. Mm. And my God, that was greatness. Yeah, it sure was. So interesting times in Scotland. We have the first Old Firm Derby at the weekend on Sunday midday. We have both Celtic and Rangers in European action on Thursday. And we might start with Celtic. I know Rangers have various issues, including a COVID outbreak. Uh, Celtic, though, are feeling pretty good about life. So they're 2-0 up against Alkmaar ahead of the second leg. Uh, post their Champions League exit, Tom, at the hands of FC uh, Micheland, things have gone really nicely. I, I see suddenly Ange Postacoglu has gone from Ange who to fan favourite here. They've had two 6-0 wins. They've had uh, six wins in a row in all competitions. I see pundits queuing up to say how much they like his style of football. I mean, Ange, Ange ball I'm seeing now, Tom. So uh, things are going very well. They are. And it's, listen, it's been kind of out of the blue. I mean, all last season was was a horrific experience for Celtic uh, fans. Um, the captain went Scott Brown, the manager went Neil Lennon, the chief executive who was there for 20 years, Peter Lowell, went. Um, the players didn't come in. The rapidity that, the, that the, the fans wanted, they got dumped out of Europe by a very, very moderate Michelin team. And it was a joke, actually. The way they surrendered that was a joke. Their, their back four that finished the second leg against Michelin had two teenagers, a 21-year-old and a 22-year-old in it. So there was up, absolute fury there. And a lot of Celtic fans that I know said, right, we're writing off the league. We're writing off the league. There's no way we're winning the league. And all of a sudden, in the relative blink of an eye, it's changed. They've got a few players in. Posta Coglu has put his own stamp on it, and he's been very impressive. But I think the guy who's, who's changed it all um, is Kyogo Furahashi the Japanese uh, striker. Mm. He's been incredible. I mean, he's got six goals in seven games. Uh, his movement, his intelligence has been fantastic. He's been compared with uh, Shinsuke Nakamura, a great Japanese player of Celtics past, uh, with Henrik Larsson, the ultimate compliment. And he's brought the best out of those around him. You know, the Ryan Christie's, the David Turnbull's, um, very Tom Rogge's guys who have been in a slump for quite a while. They look different players now. And I think it's because of him and it's because of um, Posta Coglu's management. He's been very, very strong. He actually called out the board around that Michelin time, called out the board and saying, look, you know, it's my fault. It's my fault that we don't have more players in because clearly my message is not coming across clearly enough. You know, so wow. it, it was, uh, yeah. I mean, he wasn't holding back. Celtic fans loved that. He loved the fact that he's, so, he's brave. He's a big, tough man, but he likes to play fast entertaining football and that's what Celtic fans are seeing and it's and it's very exciting for them I can't say I've seen him a huge man since he arrived but I did watch his opening press conference and he did even then strike me as an assured presence yeah look he's been around yeah. um, you know managed Australia managed clubs in Australia managed, managed in Japan won trophies along the way um, and so he's, he has he's had a pedigree and you know, I think the Eddie Howe thing was another was another problem for Celtic and that they waited so long for Eddie Howe um, to come in. It was supposedly in the bag and then he, Eddie Howe did a fairly swift U-turn and left Celtic in the lurch. And, uh, and it wasn't so much as, uh, you know, Postacoglu was like, not the special one, but the second one, he came in as like, 
in a brick glass in case of emergency option. And people were going, God, you know, this guy, who, who, you know, who, who is he? Uh, how good is he? But from that, you're right, Joe. From the first press conference, people are going, okay, this fellow's not to be messed with for a start because yeah. he's tough and he's serious. And there was a little video that Celtic put out of him on the training ground, one of his first training sessions with the players. It's very impressive uh, the way he carried himself. And every press conference he's done has been impressive. And the signings have been decent. There's one, Carl Starfeld, the centre half. Still, the jury is very much out on him. But Abada, the right winger, and um, um, Kyogo Furuhashi, James McCarthy obviously is in as well. Um, he's just signed a, a Croatian uh, right back, uh, Juranovic, um, from Legia Warsaw. He looks a good player, played in the Euros. So he's, he's put his stamp on it, Pastor Coglu, and he's been impressive. It's early days, Joe. You know, they haven't, they haven't beat much, them, but they've, they're playing like a team that can that can really do something. They have a real confidence about them at the moment. OK, because I would have thought, generally, listening to you and others at the end of last season, there would have been a real sense that we're not likely to challenge Rangers for the league yeah. next season. This yeah. could be a bigger rebuilding project. And actually listening to you now, so would there be a, you know, a kind of a not ridiculous sense now that we're in this with Rangers and we could have a proper title race here? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I wouldn't have said that a few weeks ago. I mean, this is literally kind of dropped out of the sky. So Celtic's improvements have been very rapid and Rangers' problems have come on very, very suddenly. Mm. Uh, so... I mean, you know, at the end of last season, you had protests outside um, uh, Celtic's ground. During the summer, you had uh, daily kind of banners going up. Uh, you, at one point, you had a, a banner which, which said, shoot the board. Not sack the board, but shoot the board. Uh, so you, the, the depth of feeling was, was massive at Celtic. And the kind of despair was massive. So all of that has changed now. It is early days. No, I don't. They, they are probably getting carried away, but I think they're entitled to get carried away because they had it so miserable for so long last season, mm. and they can see weaknesses in, in Rangers, which is which is the other side of the coin. They can see they can see now that Rangers are going through a little of what Ray, of what Celtic went through. Maybe the expectation is telling on Rangers. Uh, maybe the pressure of full stadiums and and on all the rest of it. But Rangers are not what they were for most of last season. Okay, because I was reading about the Rangers COVID outbreak and it seems Stephen Gerrard is uh, one of those who won't be involved uh, tomorrow night in the Europa League. Uh, beyond COVID, there are other issues, are there, with Rangers' performances thus far? Well, I mean, yeah, like, I mean, you know, they knocked out of the Champions League for a start. Um, uh, that was terrible. Uh, Malmo uh, knocked them out. Um, and having gone through the entire league season, last season, unbeaten, they lost against Dundee United, 1-0. I mean, they've taken Dundee United to the cleaners in their games last season, but they lost, lost to them 1-0. They've won three in a row since then, but against moderate opposition. So, you know, they won the, they won the league by 25 points last season. They scored 105 goals in all domestic competitions, and they only conceded 17. Now they're conceding more goals. They didn't concede a goal for their first eight, eight games last season. Now they're conceding two against Malmo, Another two against Malmo in the second leg, two against Ross County. You know, so that defence is making mistakes that they weren't making. Mm. They're not looking as steady as they were. And the Ryan, Ryan Kent, one of their stars, has not done it this season so far. There's talk about maybe one or two of them being, being transferred out. Are they being unsettled by the transfer talk? So all those things are in play. A lot of that happened to Celtic last season. And looks like history, to an extent, is repeating itself here. Okay, very interesting. And no great personnel changes in the Rangers camp to explain all this? No, no. Um, they haven't really lost anybody that they wanted to keep. They brought in John Lundstrom, uh, middle of the park, uh, from, from Sheffield United. He's been poor uh, so far. But sent off in his last game in Europe. Um, but all the rest are the same. Right. Um, so they will have to sell players because... Financially, Celtic our Rangers need to sell players. I mean, they are they are they are kind of operating on soft loans from very very loyal directors, but they're losing a lot of money. Rangers, so they need to, and I've said this publicly that they need to they need to get into a player trading model to become self sufficient. Now, if they got into the Champions League group stage, they might not have had to sell players, 
uh, because they've got whatever, 30 million plus. But they're going to have to sell players and they might have to sell some of their bigger players uh, to make the books balanced. And that, again, is enthusing the Celtic fans that maybe one or two of the best Rangers players might no longer be around. Mm. And what's Jared saying about all this over the last couple of weeks? Um, he's been, yeah, he's been, <laughs> he certainly was happier after they beat Ross County. They beat Ross County 4 2 at the weekend. Um, looked better, should have been a lot more than 4 2. Uh, so he was happy with that. Up to that, he was not happy at all and was not afraid to say it. Um, called called out some of these, that's, that's not called out individual players, but called out the mentality of the team. Um, very honestly, as he, as he has done, you know, he's been there quite a while now. Uh, last season in the league, certainly for them was great. But before that, they had, they had failures in the league and he was, and he was, he didn't shirk it. And he hasn't shirked it in the early weeks of this season saying players not looking the same, Ryan Kent, um, who they really do rely on is that he's a very, very clever player, quick, elusive, um, creative. He hasn't done it for them at all, so he has mentioned that. Um, so it's, it, it, Gerard is impressive, but this is this is a sticky time for him. And with the, with Europe coming up, and he's back in, back in Glasgow, and he'd be missing it, probably the names haven't come out yet, but privacy and all that, but mm. probably missing at least four of his first choice players will not be involved on uh, in the European game. They have to get through to that. They have to get through financially and status-wise and all the rest of it. And obviously to, to kind of you know, to calm supporters' concerns that this is a real slump that they're in. They get through that, then it's on to the old firm. You know, we talk about it as the biggest derby game in the world. It's third versus seventh at the moment, Joe. You know, it's the greatest derby in the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'll be, I'll be at Celtic and Rangers have played fewer games than the ones above, some of the ones above them. But whoever, if it's a draw, fine. They'd, I'd say they'll both sign for a draw now. Uh, whoever loses that game is going to be, um, is going to be under the cosh, particularly if it's Dirk Gerrard because it's at Ibrox and things are a bit tricky there right now. I wanted to get your take on uh, this uh, story. There was uh, some fans on the way to that most recent Rangers game and they were racially abusing uh, Kyogo Furuhashi, who you mentioned, who's been playing so well for Celtic, I think, um, singing certain songs and, uh, you know, making eye gestures to camera and all this kind of stuff. Rangers seem to have come out pretty strongly on this. Have they banned these fans indefinitely? Is it, Tom? Is it for, or is it for life, pretty much? Indefinitely. Um, and they have also banned the, the supporters group. Um, I don't know how many people are in the supporters group, maybe 50, 60, I'd guess. Uh, but all of them are also banned. So... So the, the, the guys who weren't on the bus, who, who are perfectly innocent, they are suffering the consequences of these 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 morons with the racism on the bus. Mm. And I thought that's... I'm not sure I've seen that before here. Uh, I thought it was very decisive. Uh, they were very quick to do it. Identified them quickly. Banned them quickly. Um, and that's that is that's what you want. And I think they have been been applauded by a lot of people here and Celtic and, and certainly yeah. Ange Postacoglu said fair play to them. You know, that's 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 great action to take. But I think Rangers and they're just sick, they're sick to death of this stuff. You know, they're sick of it. Um and you fell for for Ashi because you know he's in the country a wet week. Yeah. Um and he's subjected to this poison. Um and it hits home. You know, he's, he's obviously he's seen it, you can't avoid it. Uh but the club has rallied round him brilliantly. I think Scottish football has rallied round uh, to him. A fully formed human being would rally round in these circumstances. But it's sad that a, a, that a, a young boy who's in the country f for a few weeks is already being hit with this horrible racist stuff. Um, but Rangers have done the right thing here. Yeah, very decisive in fairness. And when you say Rangers are sick of this kind of stuff... Yeah, yeah. I mean, they are, and that's they have to. A, that, have, that, that suggests like it's an ongoing issue. There's been a litany of incidents like this. Well, yeah. I mean, look, you know, 
Sir, when I say that, I mean, one of their own players, Glenn Kamara, was racially abused on the pitch yeah. in Europe last season. Yeah. And that was a that was a major ordeal for them. Major ordeal for Kamara, obviously. So that was racism against them. And now some of their own are perpetrating racism against somebody else. I understand. Do you know what I mean? Yes, the hip- just, it would have been hypocritical if they hadn't taken action. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. No, you know, I understand. You know, Sorry, yeah, that, that, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Because I saw in yeah. their um, statement, they said Rangers condemns all forms of racism and discrimination, those who partake in such behaviour are not representative of our club. And I just thought yeah. that's an interesting... A precipice for Scottish football. Rangers condemns all forms of racism and discrimination. And it just made me think, so where does sectarianism come into this? Yeah, um, and that is the other, yeah, yeah. You know, that's that's the other strand to this. Um, I have, and, and some others over here have been critical of Rangers over the years um, for not doing enough uh, to combat the racism or the sectarianism problem in, in, among sections of their own support. Um, you know, we've seen it routinely, we see it, mm. unfortunately. And they need to step up more than they have done, I would say, in the past. I think they have good intentions. Uh, they have a good um, uh, inclusion campaign going. Um, but they need to match their words uh, with actions on all forms of racism. Yeah, they it, need to be true to their word. And they, uh, because sectarianism... It's 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 a it's a problem, um, for sure, yeah. and um, and they need to they need to step up on that front too. Because it struck me their statement leaves them no room for wiggle room if somebody is caught blatantly um, abusing opposition players on sectarian grounds. Like based on that statement, you know they have to come out and act very strongly. Are Celtic not just as bad yeah. and just as uh, reprehensible when it comes to not taking action? Like would it be generally agreed? I'm probably going to get you into trouble here because I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm asking as an outsider, me. but I, I would look in as an outsider and think, well, like, is it not like the two of them in it? You know, are, are Celtic seen as somehow yeah. better when it comes to that issue than yeah, Rangers? Yeah, yeah, you're walking me into a burning building, Joe. Okay. Um, um, Ranger, Celtic fans will go apoplectic as what they see as false equivalents, uh, as in they're all the same. Um, you know, they're, they're both at it. Uh, Celtic fans um, will say, look, we're a club for social inclusion, um, doesn't matter religion, nothing matters. Brother Walfred uh, founded the club, a club for all, and all the rest of them. Their their problem is um, uh, celebration of the IRA, uh, which carries on. Um, through various songs that sections of their sport support sing, the vast majority of Celtic fans are sick to death of listening to this rubbish. Mm. Um, the, w- the problem is there's a, there's, a, there's a section of supporters uh, who obviously, you know, a lot of Celtic supporters have have take great pride, rightly so, in their Irish identity, but this, the very vocal minority they express that um, pride in their Irish heritage solely through republicanism, celebration of republicanism, um, Bobby Sands, hunger strikers, all the rest of it. They don't seem to, to my mind, and I've been living here 16, 17 years now, they don't, they don't seem to have any, a very little grasp on, on modern Ireland and the problems that modern Ireland faces. Um, they sing endlessly about old Ireland and <laughs> And all of that, and, and certainly as, as an Irish person living here, when I hear various songs being sung about, they can, they can sing, they can sing what they want, I guess. Um, but it certainly kind of uh, leaves me cold. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, going into Celtics, it's supposed to be the kind of, in inverted commas, the Irish club. Um, and you go in here as and, and as an Irish person, you feel kind of, oh, this is this is not a place that I'm particularly comfortable in when they're singing, when sections, the Green Brigade, is this, the, the kind of ultras, if you like, when they're singing a, a song called Roll of Honour, which is celebrating the, the hunger strikers. And they sing it endlessly, you know, all the time. Most games they sing it. But so that's that's what you have here. It's, it's, it's very complicated. And, you yeah, know, yeah. it's tit for tat. But I, and I wouldn't say one is worse than the other. 
Uh, I'd say certainly for for sectarianism, no question. Rangers, no question. Right. Rangers, Rangers have 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 a big problem there. Right. Okay. So I'm look. I, let's get out of this burning building. But um, yeah, so, let's. I think uh, it's too late. I think I've been. In, I think I've been incinerated. No, you've, <laughs> you've inhaled the fumes now. Um, <laughs> But so the gross, the gross generalization. Look, and anyone, anyone with the brain is listening. We're having a conversation. It's, it's, um, it's not meant to offend necessarily. Um, the gross generalization might be then that from the Ranger side of things, there would be sectarian abuse, and from the Celtic side, it's more of a celebration of that IRA aspect of Irishness. That'd be kind of where you might pitch them in a, again, to generalize. But it, that would be how you, I could perceive it from the outside generally. Yeah, okay. yeah, and I think, and I think a small, a small portion of the Celtic fans would would be um, glorifying the IRA. Small portion, sure, but it's but there, it's a noise, a noisy section of the stadium, uh, a noisy section of the away support. Yes, okay. um, and that, and but the flip side, sectarianism on the other side of the city. Uh, I think I think it's not as bad as it was, but it's still there. As you still hear the songs. Um, on occasion, you hear them, and and the, one of the problems here is that the, the league, the league, Joe, is absolutely spineless. The leadership of the league, the SPFL, mm. will take no action against anybody for anything. Doesn't matter what you're allowed to sing, whatever the hell you like in this country. Right? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You can sing about Protestants. You can sing about Catholics. Um, you can sing about people being up to their knees in, in Fenian blood. You can sing it, whatever you like. Carry on, lads. The SPFL have nothing to say about it. Right. Yeah. And I think it's weak, weak leadership. And look, I mean, I, I know a lot of people over here, obviously, because I've been here for so long. A lot of people say, look, back in the day, it was a gazillion times worse. And I believe that, you know, when there was rampant prejudice, prejudice against Irish and, uh, and Catholics, um, in, in, in the central belt in Glasgow in particular. Um, I would like to think that that is not gone, but going. Um, but it's still, you know, you still, still has the capacity to shock, you know, you hear a couple of things, social media as a cesspit, that doesn't, that doesn't help. In fact, it makes it worse. It could go on now and I will find Celtic fans abuse me, calling me a West Brit, which I, find, I actually take offense to, you know, as a limit man. Um, <laughs> um, like somebody from, you know, Uktar Mukti telling me that I'm less of an Irishman than they are, um, you know, uh, and the other side, you, you'll hear, you know, really kind of insulting talk about, about your religion and stuff like that. I mean, it, it's, it's there, Joe, I don't want to make a big deal of it. No, sure. But it's, but it is there. And I think for generations in the media, the media just washed over this. They just washed over it and it carried on in football stadiums and it was never mentioned. And thankfully, I don't know, for the last 20 years or so, it might be longer than that, but 20 years, uh, people have started to talk about it and it's become an issue. And I think it's good that it's become a talking point. And it does rear its head uh, periodically over the course of the season. Very interesting. Listen, thanks so much for coming on and explaining all that to us. And, uh, well, I guess we might uh, keep a close eye on the first Old Firm derby of the season this Sunday at midday, and we might be talking to you in the next couple of weeks. Tom English of the BBC. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Cheers, Joe.